Divine Visitors, a violent mob with malicious intent, fire and brimstone from heaven. It's no wonder the story of Sodom and Gomorrah is invoked so often to condemn sexual perversion. To the broader pop culture, Sodom is a metaphor for licentious and lewd behavior. For biblical literalists, the story serves as a dire warning about sexual morality. After all, if God hates something so much he's willing to destroy entire cities over it, we ought to take notice. However, a closer look at the Bible reveals some surprises about the story and its origins. Clues we must examine go beyond not only Genesis, but the Bible itself. The crimes of Sodom might not be exactly what they seem. In this video, I'll be looking at other biblical references to Sodom, similar stories outside the Bible, the sin of Sodom, and the question of whether Lot was a righteous or wicked man. We've got a lot to talk about. Let's begin with a story recap, including the main events that lead up to Sodom and Gomorrah's destruction. The setup occurs in Genesis 13. This is the passage where Abraham and his nephew Lot part ways. Lot chooses the fertile plain of the Jordan River as the land he will inhabit, leaving Canaan for Abraham. Abraham settles at a place called Mamre, while Lot settles among the cities of the plain. These cities include Sodom, which we are ominously told was inhabited by wicked people. The story really begins, however, in chapter 18 when three strangers approach Abraham's tent. Abraham cordially invites them to stay and has a meal prepared for them. After the meal, one of the men tells Abraham that his wife Sarah will soon bear a son. Sarah overhears this and laughs to herself because she is old and past childbearing age. Then the narrator reveals that the man is not a man at all, but Yahweh himself. He reads Sarah's thoughts and repeats that the birth will come to pass. Then the scene shifts. Yahweh confides in Abraham that he is about to destroy Sodom and Gomorrah for their sin. Knowing that his nephew Lot lives in Sodom, Abraham begs for the city to be spared. Meanwhile, the other two men, who like Yahweh are angels in disguise, set out towards Sodom. When the two angels arrive at Sodom that evening, Lot happens to be sitting at the city gates. He invites the strangers to his home for food and shelter. But the wicked men of Sodom surround the house and demand that the two visitors be brought out. Bring them out to us, so that we may know them, they shout. Lot offers the mob his two daughters in exchange for the safety of his guests. They reject his offer, so the angels strike the mob with blindness. They reveal to Lot that Yahweh is going to destroy the city. The next morning, the angels force Lot to leave the city with his wife and two daughters. Lot and his family are warned to flee to the hills and not to look back. Lot asks to flee to the town of Zoar instead, and the angels agree. Then brimstone and fire rain down on the plain, destroying Sodom and Gomorrah and everything around them. Lot's wife looks back and becomes a pillar of salt. Lot later settles in the hills with his daughters. It is an empty land with no one to marry, so they get Lot drunk and then lie with him. They become pregnant and give birth to sons, one the ancestor of Moab and the other the ancestor of Ammon. Let's set that story aside for the moment. When we look at mentions of Sodom elsewhere in the Old Testament, we get a somewhat different picture. The prophetic books often condemn the city's vices, but they show no awareness of the story of Abraham, Lot, and the angels. Many of these passages probably predate the writing of Genesis, so they help us understand how the Sodom tradition developed over time. In Isaiah, Sodom and Gomorrah are symbols of punishment, used as a metaphor for the fall of Judah in chapter 1 and the future fate of Babylon in chapter 13. Isaiah is vague about what happened to those cities, saying only that God overthrew them. And Babylon, the glory of kingdoms, the splendor and pride of the Chaldeans, will be like Sodom and Gomorrah when God overthrew them. It will never be inhabited or lived in for all generations. In order to avoid Sodom and Gomorrah's fate, Isaiah 1 instructs Judah to do good, seek justice, rescue the oppressed, and plead for the widow. Jeremiah 23.14 compares Jerusalem to Sodom and Gomorrah with the accusation that its prophets commit adultery, walk in lies, and strengthen the hands of the evildoers. Ezekiel 16.49 gives more specifics about the sin of Sodom, whom it describes as a sibling to Jerusalem and Samaria. This was the guilt of your sister Sodom. She and her daughters had pride, excessive food, and prosperous ease, but did not aid the poor and needy. 
They were haughty and did abominable things before me. Therefore I removed them when I saw it. For the prophets Ezekiel, Isaiah, and Jeremiah, the crimes of Sodom are not sexual in nature, but are broadly based and describe Sodom's poor treatment of the less fortunate. It's impossible to know from these passages what calamity is supposed to have destroyed Sodom. The use of the word overthrow and constant comparisons to other nations suggests that conquest and deportation of its people must be considered. Furthermore, Ezekiel predicts the future restoration of Sodom and its surrounding cities in the same chapter. This is hard to imagine if the land has been rendered inhospitable by fire and brimstone. Hosea, a text associated with the northern kingdom of Israel, has a related passage in which the fate of Israel is compared to a different pair of fallen cities, Adma and Zeboim. How can I give you up, Ephraim? How can I hand you over, O Israel? How can I make you like Adma? How can I treat you like Zeboim? Many scholars think that northern Israel had its own tradition in which these two cities were bywords for destruction. At a later date, this tradition merged with that of Sodom and Gomorrah. These four cities are grouped together in Genesis 10, and with the addition of Zoar in Genesis 14, they become a pentapolis, the so-called cities of the plain. However, this is a late development, and it is not necessarily the case that all five cities were historically located near each other, or were destroyed together, if they even existed at all. The inclusion of Zoar might be due to the fact that Deuteronomy 34 describes it as the southernmost point of Canaan. I will not delve into the geography of these cities in this video. I will only say that their locations are disputed, and some scholars even doubt that they were real places. Let me know in the comments if you're interested in a separate video on this topic. The prophets in the Hebrew Bible read the Sodom and Gomorrah story as a kind of lesson about pride and greed. They don't read the problem about as being about sex, or if they do, they don't say that. Many of the themes found in Genesis come from older Mesopotamian literature. The creation of man, the flood, the founding of the first cities, and so on. However, the story in Genesis 18 and 19 is built around the motif of divine beings who visit humans while in disguise. No such stories are found in other ancient Near Eastern texts. However, they are very common in Greek literature. This theme occurs in the New Testament as well. Classicists sometimes use the term theoxony, from theos meaning God, and xenos meaning guest, to describe this literary theme. Theoxenies are found in some of the very oldest Greek writings. The pre-classical Iliad and Odyssey contain numerous examples. And classical writers like Callimachus, Eratosthenes, Nicander, and Ovid wrote compilations of stories that included Theoxenes. There are two such stories that are especially relevant. We know them from the writings of the Roman poet Ovid, but scholars agree that they came from an earlier Greek source. In Ovid's Fasti, there is a legend in which the gods Jupiter, Neptune, and Mercury are on a journey in Boeotia together. As evening approaches, they happen to pass by the cottage of a widower named Hyrius, who, thinking them to be strangers, invites them inside. He serves them wine while he prepares dinner. When Jupiter's true identity is revealed, Hyrius butchers his only ox and prepares a fine feast for his guests. Out of gratitude, Jupiter grants Hyrius his greatest wish, which is to have a son. The three gods take the ox hide, do something to it that Ovid is too ashamed to describe, and cover it with dirt. Ten months later, a boy is born, whom Hyrius names Urion as a pun on the manner in which he was conceived. The story of Bacchus and Philemon in Metamorphoses is especially well known. Jupiter and Mercury visit Phrygia disguised as mortal men. After a thousand homes refuse them hospitality, they are at last welcomed into the home of pious old Bacchus and her husband Philemon. Bacchus serves the two visitors food and wine. When the gods reveal their true identities, the old couple prepare to sacrifice their only goose to provide a more lavish meal, but they are stopped by the gods. Instead, they are told to leave their house and escape to the hills while the gods destroy the region with a flood because of the people's impiety. Thus spared, Bacchus and Philemon spend the rest of their days serving as priests to the gods and are transformed into trees when they eventually die. In a theoxony, the purpose of the visit is often to evaluate the morality of the host. As a passage from the Odyssey explains it, the gods sometimes visit cities disguised as strangers to see if they will be welcomed by good behavior or by evil. And the gods do, in the guise of strangers from afar, put on all manners of shapes and visit the cities, beholding the violence and the righteousness of men.
A key element of the theoxony is hospitality. According to Bruce Loudon, a specialist in Greek literature, hospitality was a sacred virtue in the ancient world because any guest could be a god in disguise. There is no middle ground in a theoxony story. The person who encounters the disguised visitor either passes the test or fails it. It is clear from these examples that the stories of God and the angels visiting Abraham and Sodom fit the formula of a theoxony. They are particularly similar to the two Greek tales just described, the stories of Hurius and of Bacchus and Philemon. In the tale of Hurius, the visit by three gods in disguise parallels the three angels who visit Abraham at a time of day when the host is resting. Like Hurius, Abraham receives his visitors graciously and offers food. God reciprocates Abraham's hospitality as the three gods in the other story do. Like Hurius, Abraham and Sarah desire a son but are unable to have one. Like Hurius's guests, Abraham's guests reveal their divine nature and promise a son through miraculous means. Both stories even use wordplay to explain the name of the newborn son. In the tale of Bacchus and Philemon, the incognito visit by two gods to Phrygia parallels the secret visit of two angels to Sodom. In both instances, the guests meet with a hostile reception, except for one house that takes them in. Like Bacchus and Philemon, Lot shows hospitality and prepares a feast for his guests. Like Jupiter and Mercury, the two angels reveal their true nature first through their actions and then verbally. In both instances, they have come to destroy the wicked people of the region, but the hosts who showed hospitality will be saved. In both cases, the hosts are instructed to flee to the hills. In both stories, the region is then flooded, with water in the Greek story and fire and sulfur in the biblical story. Both stories include a metamorphosis, the transformation of Bacchus and Philemon into trees, and the transformation of Lot's wife into a pillar of salt. In earlier generations of biblical scholarship, parallels with Greek literature were generally ignored, as it was assumed that the Pentateuch was too old to have borrowed from Greek culture. This has largely changed in the past few decades, however, as numerous scholars now see the Bible in its final form as a product of a later age when Greek cultural and literary influence was widespread. In a lecture delivered in 2009, Bible scholar Thomas Raymer observed that certain biblical accounts have astonishing parallels with Greek mythology. There is no clear distinction between Greece and the ancient Near East as regards the formation of the Hebraic Bible. Since the 7th century before our era, at least, merchandise has circulated and with it, myths. Bruce Loudon agrees on the relevance of Greek myth to our understanding of the Bible. In a recent book, he writes, Greek culture, particularly Greek myth, must be taken as a far more significant component in the background, formation, and composition of the Bible than has generally been thought. Greek myth not only provides an unexpectedly germane context for both Hebrew Bible and New Testament narratives, but also prompts reading the Bible in new ways from several different perspectives. In the passage of Genesis 19 that tells of the angel's visit to Sodom, there is a section that deviates from the framework of the Bacchus and Philemon story. It contains a subplot that is practically identical to a story in Judges 19. In that story, a Levite traveling with his concubine prepares to spend the night in the town square of Gibeah, just as the angels intended to spend the night in Sodom's square. However, an Ephraimite residing in Gibeah puts them up in his house, as Lot did. A violent mob of the city's men surrounds the house and demands that the visitors be handed over. They even use the same phrase found in Genesis 19, so that we might know him. Like Lot, the master of the house offers to hand over his virgin daughter instead. The mob refuses. And here is where the two stories diverge. The Levite's concubine is handed over to the mob, and they rape and kill her. Without question, one of these stories is borrowed from the other, but which came first is debated. I suspect that the passage in Judges is older, as it is integral to the larger narrative, and the murder of the concubine triggers a war that nearly wipes out the Benjaminites. The Sodom story would work fine without this subplot, but its inclusion helps to illustrate the city's wickedness. Bible scholar Robert K. News gives similar reasons for regarding the Judges story as the earlier one, stating that the narrative in Judges 19 is tightly interwoven into the narrative of the Benjaminite civil war of Judges 19-21 
whereas the Genesis 19 story is somewhat separable from the surrounding narratives in the Abraham cycle. This subplot also complicates the moral character of Lot, as we shall see. These elements give us a more comprehensive picture of how the Sodom and Gomorrah story might have come together. The author of Genesis was working with a basic patriarchal tradition in which Abraham parted ways with his kinsmen so that he could become the father of Israel, while Lot's sons became the fathers of Moab and Ammon, two countries across the Jordan River with similar languages and customs to Israel. The author also knew the prophetic traditions about the cities of the plain that marked the borders of Canaan in Genesis 10 and he knew the geographical reality of the inhospitable Dead Sea landscape. One tradition, that of Zephaniah 2.8, even directly associated the downfall of Sodom and Gomorrah with Moab and Ammon, the lands of Lot's descendants. Furthermore, he knew by one route or another the same Greek theoxony myths that could be found in the writings of the Greek mythographers, who in particular seemed to have provided the template for a story that explained the miraculous birth of Isaac, the divine destruction of Sodom, and how Lot's descendants ended up inhabiting the lands beyond the Jordan Plain. Elements inspired by the biblical story of Gibeah provided additional context on the crimes of Sodom as the author understood them. What was the sin of Sodom? Genesis 18 and 19 depict a stark contrast in how Abraham and Sodom respond to visiting strangers. Looking at the story through its Greek background, and the relevant passages in the prophets leads us to suspect that the inhospitality of Sodom towards strangers is a major factor in its punishment. So is there any basis to the popular notion that the sin of Sodom was lewd same-sex behavior? It mostly comes down to one sentence, the demand of the mob to know Lot's two visitors. That word know is doing a lot of heavy lifting. In Hebrew, to know can be used euphemistically to describe sex, but that isn't its primary meaning. In fact, many scholars argue that the regular meaning of the word is preferred here. For example, Scott Morshauer in a 2003 paper states that, while there is undoubtedly a play on the word no within these verses, it is completely unnecessary to take the sodomites oration as a demand for sexual intercourse. Morshauer believes that the intent of the mob is to interrogate the angels, not to rape them. Similar arguments have been put forth by other scholars in recent years. Citations for some are provided in the video description. This interpretation seems unlikely to me. In the Gibeah story, there is an obvious sexual aspect to the mob's demands as seen by their treatment of the Levite's concubine. And because the author of Genesis 19 uses the same story elements and phrasing, I have to assume that the mob in the Sodom story has the same intention. When Lot describes his virgin daughters as not having known a man a few verses later, it's obvious that sex is meant. However, Many scholars persuasively argue that the meaning of no here is not just a euphemism for intercourse. Michael Cardin writes, The Sodomites have not come to Lot's house to invite the angels to an orgy. The scene outside Lot's house is one of potential violence, however one might read the Sodomites' demand. Rape would have been the fate of Lot's daughters if the mob had accepted his offer. The consent of the daughters was not an issue for Lot, and the consent of the angels does not appear to have been a consideration of the Sodomites. In short, the verb to know here is a euphemism for rape and not an expression of same-sex desire. Several scholars I encountered during my research pointed out that in ancient times, anal penetration was an act of aggression, meant to assert superiority over the passive partner. Bruce Loudon delivers a similar assessment of the Sodom story. Though popular culture assumes Genesis 19 is a condemnation of homosexuality, responsible reading of the text and understanding of theoxenic myth reveal that the story is not about sexual preference, nor is the offense that brings on their destruction even a sexual act. It is thus hospitality, not sexuality, with which the myth is concerned. The conventional, conservative way of interpreting the story simply does not hold up to scrutiny. The problem at Sodom is not that they want to have homosexual sex. The crime here is that they want to rape the strangers who have come into their community, outsiders that they should be caring for, and that is inhospitable, and that's the crime. Excursus, is Lot evil? Evaluating the character of Lot in the story is a challenge. 
on the one hand, the Theoxony framework presents Lot as a righteous character who passes the test by treating his visitors with kindness and his life is spared as a reward. What then do we make of Lot's offer of his virgin daughters to the mob? Some Bible scholars think his willingness to sacrifice his daughters to protect his guests is intended by the author as a righteous act, however abhorrent it may be to the modern reader. Other scholars think Lot's offer is supposed to reflect badly on him, and that being raped by his daughters later is an act of revenge. One licentious act deserves another, with villain and victim exchanging roles, writes Victor Hamilton in his commentary on Genesis. George Athis, an Australian theologian, has an unusual perspective. He believes the offer is a bluff intended to buy Lot and his guests time. The crux is in verse 14, which clearly states in Hebrew that Lot has sons-in-law who are married to his daughters. Wait a second. If Lot's daughters are married, then they are no longer virgins. In other words, Lot lied about having virgin daughters. That he does not have two additional daughters is seemingly confirmed in verse 15 when the angels tell Lot to flee with his wife and his two daughters he has found after visiting the homes of his sons-in-law. That is to say, Lot's daughters weren't even present when he offered them to the mob. According to Athos, most English translations are inaccurate in these two verses, making it difficult for readers to know what is going on. I find this explanation intriguing, but ultimately I am not convinced. In my view, Lot offers his virgin daughters to the mob primarily because the author is reusing the story framework of Judges 19. In Judges 19, the mob rejects the host's virgin daughter but assaults the guest's concubine because it is a way of shaming and exercising power over the stranger in their midst. To make the same point in the Sodom story, that the mob's primary intent is violence against strangers and not the exercising of sexual desires, the same offer of the host's daughters must be made and rejected. And daughters offered as a sacrifice by their father in such a manner must be presented as virgins, whether true or not, because unlike married daughters, virgin daughters were both the property of their father and subject to their father's reign of authority in that culture. Whether the author wants us to be disappointed in Lot or not is a question we can never answer with certainty. But when we, as readers, exercise our own moral judgment, we are free to recognize the repugnancy of Lot's offer and to disagree with the author of 2 Peter, who describes Lot in glowing terms as a righteous man greatly distressed by the licentiousness of the lawless. Lot's wife is turned into a pillar of salt for disobeying God. <laughs>